Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, it's, it's, a, it's great to be in a room full of people who I admire so much. Um, so my research actually started very anecdotally. Uh, I was on a, a listserv where uh, in the sort of throes of the Ebola crisis, someone sent out an email that was a, uh, a funding proposal that cited a bunch of frontline SMS's research as a reason that people should be releasing call detail records sort of ad hoc uh, into the humanitarian community. And that concerned me a lot. Uh, my background is a bit in law uh, and running this company. So I wanted to kind of understand how technology was being used during Ebola, why there was so much excitement, you know, sort of very quickly so much excitement, and then kind of get an understanding of was it good practice and did it make sense to do it the way that everyone was saying that we should. So I'm not going to assume everybody, I'm going to assume everyone in the room was alive in 2014, uh, but not that you know a huge amount about Ebola, but I'll go through it really quickly. Essentially, at the very end of 2013, there was, a, there was a, an early case in Guinea uh, of Ebola, and what happened was the sort of virus traveled a little bit down to uh, Monrovia in Liberia. What was different about this Ebola outbreak, there had been 24 previous Ebola outbreaks in West Africa prior to this one. But what really happened in Monrovia was the virus reached a place where institutional relationships were incredibly weak and there was not a prevailing narrative. So the, the media didn't trust the government, nobody really trusted institutions, and so when this sort of unseen, unseeable, very quickly moving, very fatal disease struck, the government uh, uh, initially reacted by trying to sort of like keep everybody calm so there wasn't a lot of capital flight and they didn't lose a lot of business, and the journalism community was investigating but also very scared, and then there was just enormous and rampant rumor. And Monrovia became a flashpoint from which Ebola became a, a global concern uh, and a pandemic. I only bring that particular piece up because it also highlights one very interesting difference in motivations. Uh, the WHO, the CDC, many of, many of our kind of international public health responder agencies do not have dedicated budgets for emergency response which is deeply concerning, I hope. Um, what that means is that they are dependent on public donation and public government donation to marshal the resources to be able to respond. So automatically, the international community has a, a bit of tension in the way that it structurally interacts with the way that not, local governments essentially want business done, right? Like, Local governments and responders benefit from systems mostly continuing to function, from preserving legitimacy, and the international community needs a little bit of chaos in order to raise the funds to really respond. That's an oversimplification, but by and large true. Um, and so what happened in this particular instance is that it actually took the international community more than six months to mobilize, some, some for as, as long as nine months. So they didn't actually declare that there was a state of emergency until thousands of people were already dead. It was August of 2014. The disease had been spreading for nine months in West Africa, and there was, there was very, very little institutional response. And then, because things had reached such a fever pitch, the estimates for the, Im the potential impact of the disease were intense. There were, uh, the, the estimates range between 550,000 and 1.4 million infections by January of 2015, if, if things were to go untreated. Now, this is from a base of, of people who had been, there were about 9,000 infections at the time that these estimates were made. So to go from 9,000 to 1.4 million, and what we're talking about is a period of about four months, is a huge leap, and it's, and it's it was, one of, I think, the, the major kind of underlying factors that created the big next step. It, it created the sort of everybody, all hands on deck, we need to raise as much money as possible, we need everybody in the world to kind of go in and do this. What was really fascinating, though, is that while it was a very effective call to action financially, it also meant no one wanted to go to West Africa. 
right? Because there was this unchecked 1.4 million person disease. So the question was, how do we answer, how do we start being involved, one, from a distance, which is where a lot of the sort of social good technology community came in, uh, and then also how do we apply lots of resources in ways that we have the ability to deploy right now? And so this, this article came out and it was one of the first, I don't know if it was the most influential, but it was pretty influential, essentially saying, based on the work of a number of great organizations, uh, what about call detail records? So for those of you who don't know, call detail records are essentially, they are the backend database that mobile network operators carry about you. Now, there's a little bit of definitional gray area here because different carriers keep different things in different jurisdictions for different amounts of time. But the sort of idea is everything that an operator needs to be able to prove that you have incurred a billable charge falls into your call detail records. So that's every, every bit of data you use, that's destination and sending, sending point of all of your calls, all of your text messages. It is a deeply, deeply personal backend database that is, despite lots of really, really fantastic work, decreasingly possible to anonymize. It's not functionally impossible, but it is, it is getting that way. So call detail records seem like an easy low hanging fruit win, right? Here is this thing that we can abstract away from dying bodies, but we can use to build really functional insights that we can then use to guide humanitarian response. Are there, um, I, know there I know there are a handful, but how many people in the room have what you'd call experience with the humanitarian sector, uh, particularly in, in disaster response. So like a, a couple, I will um, offer constructively that operational coordination in humanitarian situations uh, is a problem we have yet to solve. We'll just leave it there. Um, but this is, the, the big underwriting argument, the big logic, the, the huge win in call detail records was what was called migration data, right? So it's where are people at any given time? And how can we use essentially concentrations of people to form proxy models for movement and therefore proxy models of the spread of the disease? And it sounds, that sounds great, right? Like if you don't think about it, don't think about it yet, uh, that's gonna work, right? That's the key. So now let's think about it just a little bit. Uh, this, is like, this is just a super simple diagram of the way that cell phone tower triangulation works. Essentially, the more dense the towers, the more accurate the triangulation, the further apart the towers, the less accurate the triangulation. <clears throat> um, rural Liberia, and rural parts of, of much of West Africa do not have incredible tower density. And so the accuracy of the location information that we were talking about is, um, it, it varies a lot from rural to urban and it varies a lot from place to place and operator to operator. So the quality of the migration data, particularly in the places where Ebola was flourishing, which was very often sort of outerlying districts, um, was not as helpful as people would want. There is one other kind of important bit of nuance. Almost all of the research that had been done to this point on the use of call detail records to predict the spread of disease was done on what's called vector-borne diseases, which are mosquito-borne diseases. And what that means is that there is an ambient risk. Like if, if we were in a place that, that had them, uh, and there was like standing water in the back of the room, of course that would never happen in a New York apartment, um, there, you'd have a lot of mosquitoes and like there'd be a lot higher risk that you would get whatever disease the mosquito could communicate in the back of the room than in the front. And you can start using deviations of mosquito movement to look at the way that vector-borne diseases travel. The problem is that Ebola is not a vector-borne disease. Ebola is a hemorrhagic fever, which essentially means that you have to be in touch, uh, likely through an open, you know, an opening uh, with someone else's bodily fluid in order to get the disease. So we could all be sitting here as we are, and I could have Ebola, 
I don't, but I could. And you would all leave and be perfectly safe. And not only would your location or co-location with me not be a great indicator of probability of disease, but it's, there's no part of that that you could get from mobile phone data that was not personally identifying, right? And so this is a bit of a, this, this is an argument that moves a little bit from what are the practicalities of using the data to how does that affect the legality of using the data? So hemorrhagic fevers and the indicators that sort of suggest hemorrhagic fever are almost all based on things that fall under the umbrella of personally identifying data. So you may have heard about burial practices being a really big factor. And one of the things that was particularly cruel about Ebola is that essentially when someone dies, they are at their most infectious point. And that means that if you participate in any kind of traditional burial ceremony, you are touching that person. That's, that is how a lot of the disease moved. Um, it is not, burial practices in Liberia are not standard. They're very culturally relevant and they're very, and they vary quite a bit by the culture that you find them in. So even something as, as what would seem as innocuous as like a burial practice counts under what we think of as personally identifying information. And so for this, and like many other reasons, it, it turned out that actually the kind of gradual digitization of the Ebola response created a sense of chaos as much as anything else. There were lots of people were using totally um, proprietary and locked systems. There was very little interoperability. The structure of data didn't match like to like. And perhaps most concerningly, the incentives of the different players involved varied dramatically. And so you look at the, like, the Liberian Ministry of Health, for example, and you'd think that they would be a natural point of coordination. And they were in an, in an extractive way, in the sense that everybody continued to access their databases and pull data from them. But first responders didn't prioritize reporting back into those systems. And so when it, what ended up happening is that sort of interpersonal and organizational politics and a little bit of technology infrastructure and to give everybody due credit, just the absolute chaos of emergency response meant that data reporting was not clear or particularly regular. It was very tribalized and it wasn't it wasn't commonly defined. And so what was an indicator for one group may or may not have survived as a functional indicator for another group. Um, why this is, <laughs> that's bad. That's operationally bad, right? It's just functionally not great. Um, if you look at that as a public interest problem, that is especially bad, right? All of the organizations there are there funded by and on behalf of supporting this community to heal and to, to end a global pandemic. And in, instead, we've fractured a lot of the operational infrastructure and a lot of the awareness. Legally though, and this is really where the name of the paper came from, it was a disaster. The thing is, and like not to sort of like, not to like hide the punchline here, uh, modern international organization knowledge management, data management systems are just functionally misaligned with the law. Like governments have a large incentive to localize and international organizations have a large incentive to centralize. And what that means is that if you're the International Red Cross or the UN or Frontline SMS, uh, you may have users who are putting data in in totally legal ways in their home jurisdiction that are just copying that to a centralized database that has now broken the law by having that data be accessible in any of the jurisdictions where someone can log on and view that system. So like Mark was saying in the introduction, you know, we really focus on, or a lot of the dialogue focuses on the legality of the collection or the ethics of the collection of data, but the transfer and storage, processing, analysis, all of these things are tremendously important and are playing a role in the way that kind of we define and understand the public interest in these spaces. Um, so the good news is that Ebola at this point seems mostly handled. Um, the international organizations have uh, 
are, uh, there is more debate. There's a lot more debate. And if you read, there are lots of people in this room who've probably written or, or read some of the really fantastic work that's come out about the political economy of international data use, the ethics of these kinds of things. Um, I'm, my background's in law, so I'm a little bit biased, and that's a little bit where the focus of this comes from. Um, ethical frameworks tend to do a great job of giving us kind of principles, uh, but really seem to struggle when we get to a point of kind of operational use. And I think that if there's like one really big point in this whole talk, it's that the distance between research and implementation should probably be further. And we probably need more steps in the middle and more infrastructure to begin testing and understanding the technologies and the data models that we use before, I mean, before we put public resources, particularly in places of disaster, behind them and, and have, can have really dramatic shape, uh, can really dramatically shape the course of a disaster. So I wanna take one step back uh, because Ebola was a big and like scary and like lots and lots of people have written huge things about this. There is an interesting underlying trend here and it's, it is abetted by the open data movement and it's abetted by a lot of the things that I think we ideologically believe, I ideologically believe in, but we haven't quite built the operational infrastructure for. Uh, so I wrote this thing called the open data market, and it is essentially about what happens when public goods or openly licensed goods find their way into the open market. And essentially the confluence of those two things is very, they're, they're not what we think they are. <laughs> um, open data in its current state it is expensive to produce, it is difficult to maintain, and it is very, very often incomplete. Uh, I think a recent study said something like 80% of the world's open data is virtually unusable, uh, which, which is not a criticism so much as a, a needs assessment, right? It means that we need to, underst we need to find ways to financially support the, the, the fixing or the, the preparation or the contextualization of that data to make it useful. And where that's happening right now is the private sector, which... I think lots of people, including me, are very often very excited about, you know, like it's, here's a way to sort of federate research and development costs so that, you know, we theoretically get a public benefit and then, you know, and but didn't have to invest all the costs in that messy UX research and in that messy sort of like fixing up, fixing the data set. I think that, that the problem is, is that the derivative products of open data however they come about, are not open. And so this is, I don't know if any of you all saw this, this is a, an article recently about Slate, or from Slate about weather, uh, about weather prediction models. Weather, weather data is really interesting because weather data is one of the easiest things to contextualize in the world, right? You know why weather data is important to you most of the time. So when someone says, like, here's a weather report, they don't have to say, so you can do X. They can just give you the weather data and you will theoretically do whatever X is. Weather data is also interesting because it is some of the world, it is most valuable as a prediction, right? Like almost any of us could probably climb out onto the fire escape and give you a very accurate read of what's happening with the weather right now, right? But it's what's, what's gonna happen in three hours or six hours or 12 hours, that's how we plan our days. But all of a sudden, that means that this publicly created, publicly maintained, publicly distributed data set is being turned into a commercial asset, which you then need to find a revenue model for, right? Panasonic is a lovely company, I'm sure, but like their shareholders are not appeased by the idea of like great public weather reporting. And actually Panasonic is, is the third in a string of very large data modeling acquisitions. The first was a, a company called Climate Core, which got bought by Monsanto. And the second was weather, the Weather Channel, right? Like everybody loves the Weather Channel. IBM bought weather.com. They didn't buy the Weather Channel or the Weather Radio Station, which is an interesting sort of public good question, but we'll leave that for later or never. Uh, oh look, I've lost the slides. Um, oh, cool. Um, anyway, long story short, basically these predictive models are what give 
the data that is like not particularly usable, but is totally, pu totally publicly funded and supported, the context and value that we use. And essentially, the requirement of that as a commercialization proposition means that we are building a very interesting sort of ecosystem where our awareness and the utility of publicly produced resources is privately distributed and commercialized. Thanks. That's awesome. Um, that's not a huge, that's not new, right? Like we do that with roads, we do that with all kinds of infrastructure, we do that with spectrum. But the problem is like this is a little bit about awareness. This is a little bit about politics. I don't know if anyone's seen, I, I was like it's a scarcity presentation, no one knows that. But like I just want you to really want to see this comic. Sorry, no. Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah, isn't that great? Um, Okay. Uh, so anyway, the, the, point of the, the point of the insight, the point of the, the question is what happens when we essentially privatize our situational awareness, right? Because it's like all fun and games when we're talking about is like it's a really humid day in New York, but like it's not as funny necessarily when what we're talking about is like how long is it going to take that hurricane to touch ground in New Orleans? or what happens when the cyclone lands in South Asia, right? And like, those are things where all of a sudden it becomes very clear we don't have any public interest model or exception or protection embedded in the way that we release public assets, right? Right now there is no like, your, your weather model stays proprietary until there's a hurricane and then you share it. And like more concerningly, Panasonic is going to tell us they have the best weather prediction model in the world, but like who's gone in and vetted that? How do we, how do we know that when we start putting public assets behind these models that we're getting good value for money, that we're spending public resources well? So this is something I've started calling the licensed insight economy. Um, and it's, it's, <laughs> it is methodically chosen as a title for a lot of reasons, not at all to do with the fact that the abbreviation stands for lie. Um, and and it's, it's not that prediction models are inherently bad at all. It's just that we don't have a great pathway from invention to application. And we don't know, we haven't done a lot of the good sort of like research that would tell us, are we creating more distortions? Like, are we creating more problems with this data model? Are we reflecting systematic bias? Are we replicating bad behavior? I, I assume you've probably heard from someone far more intelligent than me about uh, the ProPublica investigation and essentially the way that um, re like the, the, there was a judicial use of an algorithm that was used to predict the likelihood of, of offense or recidivism. And it essentially showed what you'd suspect, like strongly biased racially, strongly biased economically, and very much distorted the things that a judge was doing in the courtroom with very tangible, very real impacts on people's lives. <laughs> so from comic to this, this is now what's happening with Zika. There's a company called Blue Dot that has been, that has gotten a contract to, um, has gotten a contract to build a predictive model for the spread of Zika. The good news is that Zika is a vector-borne disease. So lots of the things that are being done may actually be relevant. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm on it. Uh, I, we don't even, you know, I can just like leave the deck. Um, the, the thing is, is that like, okay, so the 10, con the 10 countries that have hired Zika or hired Blue Dot to do that, presumably will have at least good access to predictive analytics. But that's only 10 countries. And like, does the, does the model change when the disease changes? And does country number 13 also have to pay? And who pays for that? And then how are we auditing or ensuring that their prediction model is better or good enough? And what does good enough look like? So like easy questions, we'll knock out by the end of this one. Um, I think that the, the trick for me is that anyone who's, who's spending a lot of time looking at the digitization of processes, this is a friend of mine named Dominic Campbell. He works for a, an organization called FutureGov, and they work with local governments all over the UK to kind of modernize practice. Um, but what we are doing is we are redefining processes, and we're doing it both in ways that we're not entirely sure work, 
and, and are, are wholly designed to change the way that our public institutions work. And we just don't know how much sort of for better or worse that is. And the, the private sector, that's okay. Like for, for most of the private sector, that's okay most of the time because the requirements around private sector funding and public sector funding are totally different things. But because they are totally different things, it also means that when the public sector starts buying from the private sector, you have to consider the reapplication of, the, of that difference. It, what happens when a public organization starts, you know, what happens when FEMA responds based on likelihood of structural damage created by a hurricane? What happens when, you know, that's correct or incorrect? What happens if someone whose home gets destroyed thinks that the use of an algorithm is actually discriminatory speech and sues the government? If these are all like big questions, right? And like lots of people love to talk about like the hypothetical lawsuits that will come from like the abusive data. And the truth is, is that like right now there's just not a lot of, there's some good class action suits out there. There are some good like, some good individual wins, but like when it comes to answering these giant open-ended questions, like there's just not a lot of good instruction. And that's what happened in my research uh, to, you know, in, in Ebola, I went in thinking like Liberia, great country, but there's just no likelihood that they have any real meaningful law. And like, this is gonna be one of those things where essentially what I do is explain how this country doesn't have any data protection law. I was super wrong. Uh, Liberia has one of the most sophisticated data protection regimes of any country in the world. It's absolutely insane. They pull directly from Convention 108 in Europe. Uh, they have a group called ECOWAS, which is the, uh, it's the Economic Cooperative of West Africa. Um, it's an interesting time for global economic cooperatives. But the, there is a body of law there and a body of enforcement mechanisms at the regional level which have which Liberia has signed on to and ratified and, and should, is, is theoretically implementing that has created this very, very sophisticated data protection law. And what that means is that not only does it happen you know, from data protection, from the perspective of privacy, but you also now have all of these really interesting other legal theories. So lots of people think about data ownership, if you think about that at the individual level, that's one thing. If you think about that at the mobile network operator level, that's another thing, right? They, they also have a commercial interest in the proprietary data sets that they create in order to run their systems. And a government coming in and essentially seizing that actually looks a lot more like eminent domain than it does humanitarian intervention. And it's not that those things are either or, right? Like governments have valid emergency powers, but what we don't have is a clear sense of what those emergency powers are, what trigger them, and what their limits are. So is going directly for CDRs the very first time, is that the desired response? Is it just as much information as possible? Or are there like due process checks? Eminent domain has due process checks. The seizure of, of any piece of property from a person during a time of emergency is something that is subject to either, in, in Liberia's case, sort of a writ from the Attorney General, approval by Congress, uh, repeated approval. If you think about it as a privacy thing, like when you're talking about security, like if you have a wiretap, uh, if any of you have ever seen the wire, you need to keep going back to the judge to get approval. That's a due process check. From a property perspective, it's even higher. Not only do you have to essentially have some authority, you have to compensate them for it. Government has to pay for access to whatever that asset is. And then you have all kinds of speech related concerns, right? So you have, is it libel if you're misrepresented in data? Is it discrimination if a public entity acts on behalf of, of data that is misrepresentative? Is it discrimination if someone reacts to a density of problem instead of a severity of problem. So like 50 people have a small problem, one person has a very serious problem. How do we weigh those in terms of how we deploy a response effort? These are just things that are big ambient questions and they get made in you know, very quick decisions in humanitarian emergencies. The forward of the paper, the, well, 
So sorry. Uh, the foreword of the paper is an example from South Korea, where in the summer of last year, uh, there was an outbreak of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. And uh, during the course of the summer, uh, there were 186 infections, and there were 34 people who died. And amidst a, a very similar public panic, the government seized this sort of entire country's CDR data. And it's a very high-density smartphone population, so very, very rich data sets. And in response, they also imposed quarantine on 17,000 people. Now, quarantine, as government actions go, is basically the most severe peacetime restriction of freedom absent a direct security threat available. Like, it is, it is enormous, and it scared everybody. Uh, tourism to South Korea fell by 40%. The economy kind of started to spiral, and the government had to issue a $9 billion recovery package. I only bring this up because a lot of the time when we talk about privacy concerns, they're very theoretical. They're very like human rights focused, or like there was this offense, but we don't really know what it cost. The South Korea example is a $9 billion price tag on a government's use of technology to restrict the freedom of its people during a time of humanitarian emergency. It may be that that was right. It may be that like history thinks that that was exactly what should have been done. And it may be that history thinks something totally different. I don't speak for history. But 34 people died and 186 total cases. Is that a national state of emergency? Whatever the answer in your head is, like we should be having that conversation, right? Because it's, it's a lot of people and it's a potentially very scary thing. But it's still like, it's still under 200 people restricting like 17,000 people in quarantine. Anyway, all of which is just to say that these are the, the ways that we are using a lot, of, uh, a lot of these assets, a lot of these tools, a lot of these approaches are not things that we have very traditional legal definitions applied to. And that law, uh, which, which I've started to call the, the law of disaster experimentation, is how do we take existing legal frameworks and apply them to these sort of new approach or <laughs> new iterations of old practices. Um, and my concern right now is that we look, <laughs> we, we seem to be both acknowledging ethics to the, you know, often to the preclusion of acknowledging law, and that's putting law in a very uncomfortable position. So really, really quickly, uh, most, most law, approaches data by personally identifying or it classifies it. Some data is fine to move around, other data is like very sensitive, like your name and address and social security number. The problem is we are progressively creating more data and we are progressively creating more open data. And what that means is, and we are also investing a lot in great data scientists, which is a good thing, but it means that re-identifying data is becoming substantially easier. And all of the definitions in law, not all, like 99%, most of the definitions in law say something is personally identifiable, something's protected, if it can be used in combination with other data to identify an individual in a context. That doesn't mean your name, that means that like I can say this person went, like, a person went to this shop and did that thing at this time in this location. That's a person in a context. That kind of analysis is getting categorically easier to do. And it means that all of the, like a lot of the privacy law, a lot of the protections that even this community, even the community that is very aware of and very concerned about sort of the use of data in humanitarian circumstances is relying on privacy frameworks that are losing significance very quickly. And so part of the reason that I focus on property law, part of the reason that I've tried to raise the specter of other forms of law is because we're going, <laughs> we're going to need a bigger boat, right? We're going to need more thing, more, more intervention. We're going to need better frameworks to really dig in. So the definitional problems in law are a big one. Um, there are a couple of people here I, who I think said they work in legal aid. Uh, access to justice is a 
functionally enormous problem. And it is also one where relying on court systems to track, understand, and enforce our data rights, particularly as they degrade, is, is dangerous. And Liberia's court system is like, it's, it's middle of the road for its region and income bracket. Sorry, this is a visualization based on the World Justice Project. The World Justice Project has a very uh, thorough or a pretty good uh, index that they use to measure access to people's people's access to their legal systems based on civil versus criminal, corruption, function, that kind of thing. Um, Liberia does pretty well by comparison, and it is still a very long way from an environment in which an individual can enforce their rights. And it is a very long way from an environment in which the law is a real ally, despite there being huge, I mean, just incredible amounts of data protection law, telecom regulation, criminal law. Interestingly, in Liberia, mobile network operators who are responsive to governments, even in times of emergency, are not protected from litigation for complying with a valid government order. So if a mobile network operator gave their data set to the government on behalf of the, you know, when the government said this is an emergency, you'll give us this data set, you can still sue the mobile network operator. And that's why, I mean, understandably, mobile network operators are terrified in many contexts. They recognize, you know, that the, the, access, that the access is extremely disproportionate and that the damage is something that they don't fully understand and that the mechanism for holding them to account for it is there. It's just very difficult to access from, you know, on behalf of the people who do. So... I'm totally pandering. This is a, a screenshot and title of one of Dana's blog posts. Um, I didn't quote her, uh, but one of the things that she said that has really struck me throughout this kind of research and throughout the work that I've done in this space uh, in this blog post is that while there are going to be great examples of how we use predictive modeling and data analytics, the greatest, the, the most concerning use cases are more likely to come from very well-intentioned, very justified actors than they are from the people who we know to be concerned about. And there's, there's, it's hard to argue that there is anyone who is more sympathetic or better intentioned than the people who rush into emergencies to try and end pandemics. And it's, so it's hard and and not always super popular to raise questions and concerns about this. But I think that the, the very last thing that I, I try and highlight, uh, 1906, the United States created the FDA. At the time that we created the FDA, there were more than 100 separate pieces of legislation designed to govern the way that we use chemicals on the human body. There was not a lot of, I mean, there's not a lot of doubt that the use of chemicals and pharmaceuticals and medicine can be beneficial in the right circumstance. And that was a hundred, a hundred individual one legislative battles, right? hundred victories for regulating individual violations. But it wasn't until 1906 that we developed that, that middle ground regulatory infrastructure that governed the relationship between invention and application. And I think that we are now very quickly getting to a place where as we look at digitization and as we look at both the benefits and the harms that we can create with these systems, that we really start to think about how do we define in invention and innovation and how do we start building a pathway to help guide it to application. And you know, there will be times when we expedite that, like we do with vaccine trials. There'll be times when it's very inefficient and ungainly, as most of the criticism of the FDA would suggest also happens. But I think that we are now in this place where we can't just look at law and we can't just assume that we will invent our way out of this problem. And it's, it's time to start investing in the social infrastructure and the, the, the testing infrastructure to, to bridge that gap. And so that's what the research is about. And hopefully that's what the talk was about. Thanks. Thanks. So, I said a 
to, to kick off this um, Q and A, I'd like to I'd like to bring in Nathaniel Raymond into this conversation. Um, uh, you know, Nathaniel's been on the ground in um, in in a number of you can sit up here um, a, a number of different um, humanitarian crises and. Like, help us understand sort of what's at stake on the ground. You know, wh why should we listen to the challenge that um, um, Sean has just left us with? And um, you know, what's 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 really at stake, and what are the risks of some, of disaster experimentation? Um, so, to put it bluntly, we are in the age now of data uh, colonialism. Period. Um, how we address the issues that are raised by Sean's paper will define the future of human freedom in the 21st century and the 22nd. We as humanitarian responders are fundamentally unequipped um, legally, ethically, and operationally um, to deal with the issues caused by the information revolution and we have thus gone ahead in the absence of a infrastructure or a theory for dealing with this revolutionary moment and instead encoded a series of aspirations and assumptions into how we are using this tech at the expense of the three heuristic things that make us humanitarians, which is rights, law, in terms of Geneva. And the third is sovereignty and respect for sovereignty. We have thought that somehow data is outside the bounds um, of those three areas. So I'll give you some concrete examples. One um, recent paper came out by a guy named Grant Gordon uh, at Columbia, came out in March showing how the Amnesty International's Eyes on Darfur project increased, appears to have increased the rate of attacks um, and targeting of attacks on villages in Sudan. It increased violence. Why that happened is this view of an ambient protective effect. This idea that the deployment of data fundamentally has an objective good in it, that more data creates more protection or more situational awareness or more advantages. And so we have done that in the absence of evidence. And fundamentally, we, to those three things, we didn't stop and ask three questions. One, what are the rights of populations to information during disaster and to control um, their information during disaster? In fact, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Geneva Conventions, um, and all of our humanitarian doctrine do not answer that question, legally or operationally. So in the absence of that blind spot, we have decided to experiment. Second, in terms of the ethical issues here, there is, I've read Sean's paper about 10 times. I think when the history of this age is written, Sean's paper will be cited as a critical moment in the development of the pedagogy to come. The big question he didn't answer, but he sets us up to answer, is what constitutes disaster experimentation underneath Nuremberg, the Helsinki Declaration, and the US Common Rule, Belmont Report, et cetera. We do not yet know in analog response, meaning response not involving data, where the line is between an accepted operational practice that has reached a certain level of proof and an experimental practice. Now we go to the third question, the third issue of the blind spot, and then I will shut up. We have actively decided as the humanitarian sector to pursue the mass collection of demographically identifiable information. We yet do not have, until my book chapter comes out in two months, a attempt to define DII. So we have engaged in the acceptance of codes of conduct based on primum non nocere ethic, first do no harm. We have attempted to retrofit PII 20th century ethics 
to data that is fundamentally not even about the PII per se, but about DII-based tracking of populations in terms of their temporal spatial metadata. We are doing what the NSA does, and we are attempting to develop that capability using ethics that do not countenance, countenance the data model which we are producing. Put it this way, I can kill people, and I think work I've been involved in has killed people, um, and we have been entirely ethical in terms of 20th century response. That's the big takeaway, is that fundamentally we have, in retrofitting the PII ethic based on institutional unitary control of individual data into data scenarios that actually don't really aim to collect that data, we have been allowed to inflict a harm with actual no, no actual ethical doctrine to stop us. And we might even not know. So that's where we are now. Do you want to respond to that? Or does anyone want to respond just to the play? Thank you. First of all, thank you for that. It's super interesting. Um, I'm struck by the incommensurability of the twin harms of a, uh, an infection that gets uh, to epidemic levels and the long-term privacy violations that may be occasioned by a one-time release of data. And the, I think your sense of we need a framework to talk about this. Are there any analogies that you have seen where people have tried to balance similar kinds of concerns, or is this genuinely a new problem? I think that there are large parts of the problem that are new, and it's because of the replicability and distributability of data. And so I think that, um, you know, I think that there are lots of concerns about what happens with very high stakes, and that those conversations are well known, whether they are privacy or pharmaceuticals or any number of things. But essentially, the fact that there is no supply chain and there, there's no functional supply chain and there's no bottleneck. Like most, most production-oriented production harms have a bottleneck. And once data is out in the wild, you can't really, don't know where it goes, can't find it from place to place. And one of the big legal questions is, okay, I know my privacy has been violated. In order to prove that, I have to be able to point to the original disclosure and to the harm, right? So I don't think that we're quite there yet, both because of orders of magnitude and because of distributability. And the orders of magnitude problem is like something like in Liberia, Liberia is a comparatively well-established country in that region of the world, and it's had two civil wars in recent history. And, you know, there's the short-term version of things where, like, there are some humanitarian organizations who are saying that Sierra Leone is now using data control practice as a way to crack down on politically inconvenient civil society groups. So that's, like, an immediate harm, but it's not the kind of thing that, like, really evokes a visceral, like, a huge visceral reaction from the same scale of people. Whereas, like, if you knew, like Nathaniel's saying, that, like, people had died because of a data model, you'd have a very tangible discussion of the problem. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm, no, like, I'm no big fan of exceptionalism, and so I think that like, most of these problems have very historic roots. We're contemplating these things, but I think that the, the, the structure of data distribution means that it is at least a unique, there are elements of it that are unique. You know, I think one, pro one issue, I don't know if you touched upon this as, as um, much as I might have wanted you to, but... Um, <laughs> You know, even if um, the, the massive amounts of um, call detail records were going to be helpful, um, sort of handing that off to organizations which might not have the capability to even deal with these issues, I think is a really important part. And I, I know Keith has sort of thought a little bit about this. Like, Keith, what are, if I'm going I'm to put you on the spot. Um, well, like, like, what do these organizations really need to think about? I mean, organizations that, you know, are, are first responders, they're human, they, they jump into humanitarian crises, but, they, but they're certainly not 
you know, tech companies, they're certainly not, they might not know um, how to handle data. Like what, what's, what's sort of at risk and what's at stake there? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, it's something I, I worry about, I think about a lot. I, I think, uh, ev like at least every other week I get asked by some organization, some human rights or humanitarian organization, uh, for advice about some sort of software that they're putting together or a database or an app or something. Uh, but they're all collecting data. Uh, I mean, it's really, really common now. And uh, this might sound weird in this context. It doesn't sound so weird in Silicon Valley. I'm based in Berkeley, so it doesn't sound so weird over there. It might sound strange here. Um, but I'll, I'll, like here, we focus a lot on the problems of private ownership of massive amounts of data, which there definitely are problems. But uh, when you're on the humanitarian side or on the NGO side or you're working with tribunals or courts or governments uh, like I do, uh, and you see them trying to get massive collections of data to do really good things, but without, what, what you see is that they're going into the software business. Or they're going into the data business, like just like a, a, a Google or a Microsoft, but they're not doing any of the other investment that you have to do to do that well, and they're also not subject to market pressures. So everybody laughs uh, when Eric Schmidt says, you have to trust me that we won't, that we won't reveal your data at Google, you have to trust me. But he, he has, his argument is we have a huge market incentive to keep your data safe. Maybe that's not the greatest incentive in the world and maybe that's not the best safeguard in the world, but it's sure a heck of a lot better than some of these other organizations where they just have their goodwill, which is great, as long as they really know what they're doing and are, and are actually equipped and resourced to do something about it. And that's what I see uh, as a huge problem in the, in the humanitarian and government sector. So what, what, when I said it'll sound weird in this audience, what I mean is I often end up telling these organizations, do not store this data yourself. Like, just leave it in the cloud, leave it in, uh, if, if Google's already storing it, let them store it, get a way to get secure access to the data, but don't store it yourselves. Why? Because it's probably somebody with a big Excel spreadsheet um, on an unsecured file server in an office that doesn't even have any locks on the doors. And like, maybe that's fine. Uh, back in the old days, there's a, an old phrase, security through obscurity. So if you don't know that this organization has it and nobody really cares what they're storing, maybe that's not a big deal. But in the context of human rights or in humanitarian cases, specifically conflict connected humanitarian cases, it's the worst security scenario you can possibly imagine. If you're starting to put together a, a security, if you're putting together your security threat model and you're assessing, uh, okay, who are, the, who are my adversaries? Who are my potential adversaries? Who are the people that might want this data and they might want to do something bad with this data? They're the most sophisticated actors uh, you can imagine. Governments, um, uh, sophisticated militias, uh, uh, people like Islamic State or uh, uh, the United States government, uh, the, uh, the, the government of China, often are, they have massive amounts of resources and sophistication to marshal to get at this data. And if what you're storing is like, I don't know, a database of witnesses to a war crime and the crime was committed by a, a very sophisticated government or even an unsophisticated one but that has access to resources, they're going to get your data, and now they've got a list of witnesses, and they don't want those witnesses to testify. And uh, that's a really, really bad scenario. And in that case, I would much rather have uh, Google uh, storing that data, if anyone's gonna store it at all, which I think is the, the threshold question. But if, uh, if someone's gonna store it, I would much rather have Google that has over 500 security engineers protecting it <laughs> than uh, an NGO that has nobody, like, like literally no one. Uh, tasked or responsible for data security. I, I think just to, just to touch on that, like the OPM hack is a great example of that, right? Like enormously valuable trove, totally state to state. But I think that the, the answer to the question to me comes down to how well you can define the process. And that's part of the reason that sort of algorithmic transparency is something that I think is rightfully getting a lot of attention. But you know, it's basically if you can justify why you have the data and why you're going to use the data, like or what you need from that data, there's all you've already made a huge amount of progress. There was a person who's leading uh, field work from the CDC that I talked to, and she was like, "Look, 
really all we need is people's temperature. Just like if we can get their daily temperature every day, that is redundant, but we'll, know, we'll have a much better model of the spread of the disease than if we track like their behavior or their migration or anything like that. And, but all of the technology companies that we're trying to get involved, we're also looking at ways to monetize their intervention. And so it was tracking location, it was tracking contacts and social connections, like all of this stuff that the CDC was like, we don't, we don't need that. Anyway, agree. Thanks, Sean, that was really great. Um, if I can recap what I think I heard to be the proposed upshot of your talk, it's that we need social and institutional infrastructure to support more processes of uh, not just research, but also evaluation, deliberation, monitoring. Um, what else might go into that infrastructure, might be constituted in that infrastructure, and more importantly, whose responsibility is it to build that? Yeah, those are definitely easy questions. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> I, uh, there's a version of this that would put everyone to sleep. So I will say very quickly, um, as I suspect you know, uh, the first thing is that whether we're talking about individual ownership or theories of ownership, I think that a lot of these processes would be best served by having a fiduciary duty, right? We've, lots of people are talking about fiduciary duty in different contexts, from John Oliver talking about your financial advisors to Jonathan Zittrain talking about it in cooperatives and collectives around data. Uh, the easiest way to create a fiduciary duty, in my understanding, is uh, trusts and that we, have, we use trusts to protect both public processes and public assets all over the world. Uh, and you know, it's, it's high time, I think, that we start looking at creating independent, publicly beneficial, fiduciary, fiduciarily and legally accountable trust infrastructure to start doing a lot of that. Um, and then the other thing is, a super short answer on this is most of the rules that we're talking about will be interpreted differently in, co in different court systems around the world. And what that means is that Google's terms of service as interpreted in Brazil are very different than what you might get if you challenge them in Russia or Australia or Europe. That regional variation suggests that actually the kinds of cause of action that you can bring in commercial courts are some of the best tools to start framing this work. So things like professional standards, things like, you know, professional standards in an industry define what counts as negligence. And so if there are no professional standards, then everybody can kind of do everything because there are no standards. But if you get even like a little bit of a critical mass of an industry to agree that these are standards about how you do things, then deviation from those standards can be challenged in a whole different, like a whole bunch of different places. It's the same thing like if you look at the, the growth and evolution of software licenses. Like software licenses are privately created contracts that got a couple of very big early adopters such that the operational cost of completely throwing them out the window would have been very high. And then like you got the Apache license and the Sun license and like those became really dominant public licenses until Creative Commons and others have come out with different versions. But I think that we're seeing kind of, in the same way that we're seeing the privatization of a lot of insight, we're also seeing the privatization of a lot of enforcement. And so finding good contractual mechanisms and good civil law mechanisms to chase that, I think will be really important. Okay, so we have um, three more minutes left. So what I'm gonna quick. do is take um, three quick questions and then um, you could sort of answer and conclude. Sure, sure. So, thanks. Thank you so much. Yes, this has been a really, really great talk and this is a little bit outside of my area, so I've learned a lot. Um, my question was just in terms of whether or not there have been any effective examples of models that um, involve affirmative consent to participate, um, so voluntary participation. Um, because one of the things I constantly r wrestle with in terms of thinking about the ethics of data sharing is, you know, are there cases in which it's actually, you have an ethical obligation to collect the data, right? And like, that's why like this example of disaster response and, you know, dealing with this like very time sensitive situation where it's literally life and death, you may have people who very much want to contribute, right? So I just wondered um, if there were some examples like that that have proven to work. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, thanks for this great presentation. Um, so you mentioned that this whole um, data disaster comes from a sort of data ecosystem, right, with different actors collecting and using and sharing their data. Uh, and you also touch upon the fact that they have different incentives for participating in this ecosystem. And I'm worried if you, uh, I'm, I'm curious if you could elaborate a bit on these different incentives and what you think the incentives were that led to this irresponsible experimentation. There's one in the back. Well, to many of you, this was news that was probably buried with much of the Brexit coverage from the UK. But recently, the NHS, they shelved their data systems, their personalized health data system. It's at least on hold for now. And the issue was, I mean, you're claiming it's this atmosphere of paranoia about I mean, what's going to happen to this once it's being shared. So, and that was too much agreement from that community. So the issue is when you have that situation where neither side really trusts the other, you got that lack of trust there, that void of trust. So what would be at least your first steps in recovering that trust if you really want to make data use both effective and? Yeah. Uh, so I, the reason that I always talk about trusts is because they are literally, they are contractual mechanisms functionally designed to answer that question. And so I believe, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna do this in reverse order really quickly. Uh, the, so the trust to me is best developed with open processes, uh, publicly accessible sort of communications about those processes and reliable, like essentially reliable administration of them. Uh, and so that actually gets a little bit to your question. Affirmative consent, um, so sorry, trusts, if you publicly governed a trust in a way that was like very visible to the public, I think that would go a long way. And my first step would be using very limited data licenses and embedding the ownership and management of the data from those licenses in a trust administered by a trustee. For affirmative, in, in terms of affirmative consent, um, I actually, I like, I love the organ donor program. And the organ donor program I think is like situationally a really good example of this. Like, it's, it's harder to do with data because data doesn't have functional limitation in the same way. But there are a number of research organizations that are starting to get beneficial access to people's privately held data. I think that mobile network operators could go a lot further in terms of offering people conditional opt-ins. So if there is a pandemic, do, can we share your location data? Like that is a, as a limited license is something that I think a lot of people would sign right up for, and hopefully, you know, rightfully so. Um, I got into this a little bit in a, a, a different conversation, but the other thing that's great about really limiting data licenses is that they create a contractual cause of action. So if you can prove that a data license has been violated, you can litigate on that without having to prove like data privacy or data protection violations. And contractual like the mechanisms of contractual legal administration are actually much more accessible than, you know, like ECOWAS's Human Rights Tribunal. The incentives piece is an enormous question depending on kind of who the actors are. I think that there is a competitive pressure amongst responders for public funding, whether they are donations or whether they are governmentally assessed funding, you know, governmentally uh, dispersed funding. I think that the competing incentives to the, short answer, the shortest answer to this question is like, I think that the, the abuses come from good intentions absent dedication to process. Like I think that, you know, there's an old Abraham Lincoln quote, which is if you gave me six hours to cut down a tree, it's been the first four sharpening the ax. And the humanitarian community is a study in ignoring that quote. Uh, and they're, you know, like well-intentioned, but like when you hit the ground in Monrovia and people are dying and there's chaos, like, the last thing you're gonna, I mean, the last thing most organizations do is sit down and be like, okay, what does our reporting infrastructure look like? And like, how do we make sure that like our beautifully defined and very interoperable sets make it back to the Ministry of Health's currently totally inaccessible system? And so I think that there's just a, you know, and I think there's a little bit also what sort of Clay was talking about, which is like, how do you, given the exigency of a circumstance, the theoretical nature of a harm or the, the, the perception of a theoretical nature of a harm and, you know, a lot 
a lot of implementation infrastructure. Like, how do you start weaving those together in ways that make real sense uh, and are also responsive? And I think that the reason that I use the FDA as an example is like, it's not, per it's not close to perfect, but they have expedited tracks. They have criteria, they have animal and then human trials. Like, and I think that there is, you know, people have been talking about investment in prevention in the humanitarian community for an enormous amount of time. And my, my very sincere hope is that like the size of issues embodied by experimentation with data models and technology will, will help really establish what the cost of not doing good prevention investments are. And I think that if we, you know, if we can in, invest in the research infrastructure and invest in the testing infrastructure, I think that will go a long way to bridge the gap. And I think that will also not, you know, I think there are a lot of organizations that are trying to do the research and then they get pulled into implementation. And that creates an uncomfortable thing because like you wanna support them for doing the research but be very critical or at least be very thoughtful about what happens when it gets into implementation. And so, I mean, not to like hit on a very old humanitarian trope to close it all out, but I think that, I think that incentives align much more cleanly if we have a clear delineation of invention and application and a, a, a set of structures designed for research to manage the pathway between them. And with that, um, we're out of time. And so um, Sean's gonna be around to talk a little bit more after this, but please join me in welcoming him for a great day to bed.